Okay. So I'd like to welcome everyone for another edition of uh, Quantum Fluids and Isolation. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce Professor Dieter Volthardt um, this week. So uh, Professor Volthardt got his Diploma of Physics from University of Hamburg in 1977, and then his doctoral degree at University of Hamburg in 1979. He then postdoc under Peter Wolfel in the Max Planck Institute of Physics and Astrophysics in Munich from 1979 to 1984. He was a Heisenberg Fellow at the Max Planck Institute from 1984 to 1987. He has been Professor and Chair in Theoretical Physics at Aishan University from 1987 to 1996. He was then Professor and Chair in Theoretical Physics at the University of Augsburg from 1996 to 2018. And he's been a Professor of Theoretical Physics Emeritus since 2018. He's a recipient of numerous awards, including but not limited to the 2006 Geophysics Prize of the European Physical Society, the 2010 Max Planck Medal of the German Physical Society. In 2011, he was elected to the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. In 2020, he was elected as fellow at the American Physical Society. So today he'll be talking about um, some work that he's very uh, well known for on superfluid helium theory from very low temperatures to the Big Bang. So please help me in welcoming either by muting yourselves and clapping or by clapping virtually, Professor Dieter Volthard. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone in whatever time zone you are. Um, it's evening here at seven o'clock um, p.m. in Germany. Uh, thank you, Joshua, for inviting me to your quantum fluids in isolation seminar um, to organize such a Zoom seminar in, in these unpleasant times is really um, a great idea. So I will talk about superfluid helium-3 from very low temperatures to the Big Bang, whatever that means, I'm going to explain. Now, superfluidity was discovered in 1971, exactly 50 years ago, so this is an anniversary, and was then intensely studied worldwide for um, more than 15 years. So far, Nobel Prizes have been awarded to four physicists involved in this research, and I think it's fair to say that there is no other research field in physics that has so many connections to um, other areas in physics. Superfluid helium-3 is really mm, the uh, ideal testing ground for almost all fundamental concepts of modern physics. And I think that every physicist should know at least a little, little bit about that. So, I plan to provide a simple non-technical introduction, which leads us from low temperature physics all the way to the early universe. And on the way, we will encounter the great universality of physics, which we are so proud of, but uh, which we often lose sight of in our daily work. Um, for a more detailed introduction, see chapter one of my book with Peter Wölfte. If you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Okay, now let's see whether that works. Um, somehow, somehow uh, it doesn't go on here. Somehow this froze. Ah. Okay, I think, I think I have to press harder. Okay, very good. There are two stable helium um, isotopes, helium-4 and helium-3. Helium-4 is part of the air we breathe, but only at a fraction of um, five ppm. It occurs in higher concentration in oil wells because of natural um, radi radioactivity, alpha decay. But it was discovered not on Earth, but um, indirectly in a, during a solar eclipse because there was a line in the spectrum which was unknown. So scientists immediately concluded that it was due to an element um, that occurs on sun and they called it helium. And only some almost 30 years later, Lord Ramsey extracted minute amounts of um, helium-4 from a cleveite, that is a uranium oxide. Now, Helium-3 is even much rarer. So it's one ppm of the helium-4 in the air, which is so rare anyway. So it's a millionth ppm in the air that we breathe. And uh, just to give you an impression, uh, the air in a typical lecture room or seminar room 
uh, contains one soccer ball full of helium-4 and, um, and let's say the size of a um, grain of rice of helium-3. That's so very little, very little. Why is that so little? Well, because it's so light. Any helium-3 that is or was in the atmosphere escaped into space. So appreciable amounts of helium-3 can only be produced by a nuclear reaction, namely lithium plus a neutron gives tritium plus alpha particle, and the tritium is unstable with a half-life time of about more than 12 years, and it, um, it decays into the stable helium-3. Um, with this connection, is, it's clear that this is connected to um, the hydrogen bomb. So research on, on, on larger samples of helium-3 is only taking place since shortly after the Second World War. Let's take a look at um, the helium atom. Helium atom, helium is a noble gas, uh, noble in more than one sense, by the way. Um, it's sort of, sort of boring because it's spherical and it has a diameter of about 2.5 angstrom. The interaction, well, on one hand, it's repulsion, it's strong hard sphere repulsion, and there is an attraction, of course, due to weak van der Waals dipole and um, higher multipole forces. Because of that weak attraction, the boiling point is low, 4.2 Kelvin. And this was um, managed by Carbonic Honors, who got the Nobel Prize for that in 1913, not for discovering superconductivity. And the boiling point of helium-3 is a little, little lower uh, because the mass is a little lower. So that's easy to understand. The most important thing is helium, um, liquid helium, is a simple liquid, it's very dense. The interparticle distance is um, of the same order as the diameter. And it's isotropic, short range interaction, and it is extremely pure. So this is the phase diagram of helium-4. This is pressure in bar. Well, that's not permitted anymore. So uh, 10 bar is one megapascal and temperature here. We here see the normal fluid. Um, here, the vapor pressure line, here above about 26 bar, the solid, and here the famous lambda line and uh, the superfluid. If we superimpose the phase diagram for helium-3, well, it looks similar. The vapor pressure line is slightly retracted because of this uh, um, lighter mass. The solid is at higher pressures, but there is this famous minimum first discussed by Pomeranchuk because at these low temperatures, the liquid has a lower entropy than the solid. So the clausius clapeyron equation says that this is negative here. But there is no analog to the superfluid here. And uh, so that is a little um, strange. And we need to better understand this. The most important point is that because of the isotropy and the weak interaction, um, weak attraction, helium remains liquid all to down to temperature equal to zero if the pressure is not high, uh, too high. That is interesting because the thermal wavelength obtained by equating the KBT and the kinetic energy is, is a quantum mechanical beast and is proportional to one over root T. So for T going to zero, it becomes larger and larger and eventually it fills the entire uh, experimental cell. So there must be quantum phenomena on a macroscopic scale. But the question is, what are these quantum phenomena? For that, we have to look inside the helium atom um, because for once, yeah, although this is condensed matter physics, um, the electrons are unimportant. They, um, the electronic shell, it's, it's a noble gas, so there are two electrons, they pair to a spin zero and that it, it, it's not of great interest for us here, except that they uh, make the Coulomb cage for the hardcore interaction. What is more important is the nucleus. Helium-4, as you know, has two protons and two neutrons. So the total spin is zero and the entire atom is a boson. And at 2.2 Kelvin, there's this famous uh, phase transition, which we can view as a Bose-Einstein condensation where a fluid with zero viscosity um, is created. In helium-3, one neutron is missing. The nuclear spin is then a half uh, h-bar. The entire atom is a fermion. 
So, so we see at low enough temperatures, these liquids are quantum liquids, a bosonic liquid and a fermionic liquid. But there is no counterpart to this um, superfluid transition. And the question is, is there a transition at all? And for decades, it was, uh, it was thought and even printed in Encyclopedia Britannica there could be no transition because it's fermionic. But of course, we know that is quite wrong. There is a possible instability. And for that, we have to go to interacting fermions to a fermi liquid, consider the ground state. And due to Landau, we know how that looks. There's a filled Fermi sphere, there's a Fermi surface that distinguishes between inside and outside. And if we now add two non interacting fermions, quasi particles, that is, here, then if there is an arbitrarily weak interaction, and the important point is it can be arbitrarily weak, then the ground state is unstable against Cooper pair formation as shown by Cooper in 56. So a Cooper pair with K and minus K is two quasi-particles, and the energy is lowered by a non-perturbatively small contribution where epsilon sub C is the width in energy around the Fermi surface where the attraction occurs, whatever the attraction comes from, and e to the minus, um, and then there is an exponential factor. This is the density of states, and this is sort of the depth of the potential or the strength of the attraction in the L channel. And this is a universal property of Fermi systems. Every Fermi system is, is um, sort of um, unstable towards that. Now, we can view a Cooper pair as two quasi particles um, um, sort of moving around each other with K and minus K and they are separated sort of on average by this coherence length. And elementary uh, quantum mechanics tells us that because of the anti-symmetry of the pair wave function, that two possibilities, either the relative orbital angular momentum is even, then the spin part must be a singlet with S equal to zero. Or if the relative angular momentum is odd, then the spin part is a triplet S equal to one. It's as simple as that. So we know from the beginning for L equal to zero S wave, we have an isotropic pair wave function. It's spherically symmetric. While for L larger than zero, we, it's called P or D or F wave pairing. Uh, the pair wave function is anisotropic. And immediately after BCS paper um, in, the, in the Soviet Union, it was suggested that also helium-3 is unstable, but um, because of strong hard core repulsion, it was suggested that the, um, couple, uh, that the pairing is in an L larger than zero <laughs> state, although this was completely without any basis because you cannot, uh, you have to do it in Landau theory. And um, this was just hand-waving arguments at that time. Um, L equal larger than zero is good for uh, for helium-3 because then the pair wave, there, there is a node at r equal to zero, sort of in the middle of this pair, which cuts out the interaction region. Okay, BCS theory, as we know, is the generalization to many Cooper pairs. Pairs then condensate, we speak of a pair condensate. And for the simplest case of S-wave pairing, we have an isotropic gap around the Fermi body um, protecting the inside from the outside. And the transition temperature in weak coupling theory is given by one of the most beautiful um, short equations in theoretical physics. Tc is a numerical factor, which is sometimes written wrongly in the literature, it's 1.13. Um, then epsilon sub c again is the width in energy around the Fermi surface where the attraction is acting. And then comes this exponential factor e to the minus one over the density of states. And here's sort of the depth of the attraction the potential in the Lth channel. This is such a marvelous equation. Um, particle physicists envy us for that because it solves a long-standing family problem. You see, um, in n of zero, the density of states, um, and let's talk about electrons. There is um, the typical temperature 
is the Fermi temperature that is typically 50,000 K. This would be the Debye frequency or Debye temperature, typically 500, so a factor of 100 lower. And because of the exponential behavior, Tc is of, of the order of a few Kelvin, let's say five. And even giants like Heisenberg and Fein, Feynman failed to get this result and to solve how, in a non-perturbative non sense, these three energies are connected. Now in helium-3, nothing is clear from the beginning. It's not clear why, what is the attraction? Uh, what, how, how strong is it? What's the magnitude? And hence, you can't calculate TC. You can't calculate TC even today, in particular because um, <coughs> you cannot use recoupling theory in general. So already in 1957, there were predictions about TC at unattainably low temperatures. Experimentalists um, searched, the TC improved, so to speak. Um, experimentalists went back to their lab, found nothing. The TC was renormalized. Experimentalists went back again, found nothing, and they just gave up. It was no interest, not interesting anymore. And nobody searched for superfluid helium-3 anymore. So it was a great surprise when on, on Thanksgiving 1971, in an experiment that had nothing to do with superfluid helium-3, um, a transition was detected at the incredibly low temperature of 2.6 millikelvin by Oshroff, Richardson, and Lee. They first thought that it was a transition in the solid, the Martin-Sittig transition. Then they found that it's actually coming from the liquid. And that was the discovery of the superfluidity um, in helium-3. Um, and 25 years later, the Nobel Prize was awarded for their discovery of superfluidity in helium-3 to David Lee, Doug Oshroff, and Bob Richardson, who unfortunately died eight years ago. Why it took so long, we can perhaps discuss in the end. It was clear that the Nobel Prize would be awarded, but there were other candidates that um, could have been considered. So let's take a look at the phase diagram of helium-3, and now we do so pressure versus temperature, but now on a logarithmic plot, because to squeeze it all in, we need a logarithmic scale. We see, in fact, while we, in the earlier phase diagram, we didn't, we didn't see anything on a linear scale because everything was hidden in the ordinate here, okay? And um, so here we have the gas, we have the um, vapor pressure curve, we have the Fermi liquid, and then here we have a superfluid B phase, which covers most of the area here. And at elevated pressures where fluctuations are particularly um, pronounced, there's another phase, the superfluid A phase. At, at higher pressures, it's a solid. And even that solid has interesting structure, namely um, at, um, until a temperature, which is even lower than the superfluid phase transition, there's a transition from disordered spins to antiferromagnet mag magnets ordering, and there is even more rich uh, uh, behavior up here. It's, it's just amazing that this simple liquid shows such a complex and rich phase diagram. Although it's isotropic, short range interaction, extremely pure, the only reason why this is so is the nuclear spin out. If we do insist on a linear scale, we have to um, zoom in to a millikelvin range. And then we see that indeed the superfluid A phase is a little larger than thought and the log log logarithmic plot. So normal fluid, A phase, B phase, solid. And I should remind you that just above the transition, normal fluid, helium-3, is a highly viscous um, liquid. It's, 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 it has the viscosity of machine oil. And then abruptly, as we cross into the B phase, the viscosity becomes uh, or goes to zero exponentially. If a magnetic field is switched on, <clears throat> we find another oh, phase, the A1 phase, which is just a little wedge between the normal and the A phase. So they're all together 
three stable superfluid phases. Now, um, such techniques um, or such low temperatures uh, can only be achieved by sophisticated techniques. I show you here the millikelvin cryostat at the Walter Meissner Institute for Low Temperature Research in Garching, where I'm regularly attending. And in fact, um, this seminar is called quantum fluids in isolation. This inside is a quantum fluid in isolation in the perfect sense because you, very, you need very good thermal isolation. And um, we speak of very low temperatures when um, the temperatures are much lower than the boiling um, point, three Kelvin. Now, you see, almost always nature is more powerful than human technology. Energies, pressure, magnetic field, high temperature, nature is always better, but not when it comes to low temperatures. Because <clears throat> these temperatures are also much lower than the lowest temperature um, observed in the universe, that is the background radiation of 3K. So every place like a cryostat, which has a temperature considerably lower than 3K is a singularity in, in the cosmos. Sometimes it's said Earth is not a special place, but that's quite wrong. Earth is a special place because every cryostat on Earth is a singularity um, regarding low temperatures in the cosmos. And I sometimes imagine that if it was possible to map the points in the universe where the temperature is appreciably lower than 3K, this would be a map of intelligence, well, at least um, technical intelligence. In, in the early days, right after the discovery, there was actually a mystery, and I want to share this with you. The experiments at that time are done by nuclear magnetic, magnetic resonance. This is the perfect tool to work with nuclear spins a half. And this was the result they found, Osher et al. This is the frequency as a function of temperature. In the Fermi liquid, in the normal Fermi liquid, the resonance frequency is, of course, the Lamo frequency. That is clear. But as they entered into the A phase, something strange happened, namely the resonance increased. And you can, you can sort of, um, you could explain that if there was a, an internal field of about 30 Gauss, but where on hell, um, Leggett said, should this field come from? Experimentalists found phenomenologically this Pythagorean rule where this increase here is purely dependent on temperature. Where on earth can it come from? Now, you might say, why not? Well, it can't because any shift in the Lamar frequency, you can prove that mathematically, must be due to spin non-conserving interactions. But there is virtually no spin non-conserving interaction in this isotropic fluid. If you dig around, you find, yes, okay, there is the dipole-dipole interaction of the nuclei. But this is very weak. It's 10 to the minus 7K, which is much smaller than TC. TC is 10 to the minus 3, but still four orders of magnitude larger than this. So what is the origin of this frequency shift? And this got uh, Tony Leggett into the game and because he thought at that time, 1972, that perhaps under these extreme conditions at low temperatures, perhaps the foundations of quantum mechanics or statistical physics were not complete. Now we know they are complete and the answer um, I will give, but first we have to learn a little more about helium-3. So the research shortly after the um, discovery, 19, early 1970s, was there was a wonderful combination between experiment and theory, mainly NMR or spin dynamics experiments and uh, collective modes, sound wave, sound modes. Experiments done by Osher, Richardson and Lee and Wheatley, of course, John Wheatley, who had been the king of helium-3 for decade, for many years. And in theory, Tony Leggett and Peter Wölfler and uh, David Marmon and others. And it soon turned out that Miraculously, in all three phases, the same kind of pairing takes place, namely P wave and spin triplet, L equal to one and S equal to one. Now you remember what I said about um, these characteristic directions. We know immediately from that information that in every Cooper pair, 
the orbital, there's in orbital space and in spin space, there is a characteristic direction corresponding to L equal to one and S equal to one. At this point, you may ask, um, where is actually the attraction coming from? That's an interesting um, point. There's no simple answer because this is a strongly correlated many body system. There's no small parameter. It's a liquid, everything interacts with everything. There is no small parameters. There's no Migdal theorem. So, but the, the, the simplest argument um, is from Phil Anderson and Bill Brinkman who explained the stability of the A phase. Namely, they say helium-3 is a strongly renormalized Fermi liquid. Large effective mass, strong magnetic interactions, implying that the spin susceptibility is by a factor 24 larger than a Fermi gas. So it's very spin susceptible. So you can imagine that if a spinner half sort of moves through the system with K, momentum K, then it partially polarizes the medium on this path. And then a second particle with minus K can lower its energy if it goes in that path with the same spin. So altogether it's S equal to one. That's spin fluctuation. It's not the whole truth, but it's helpful. So let's just uh, run through the superfluid phases of helium three to get, get an impression. First, there is the B phase, which is the um, largest um, phase or the, the, the much covers most of the uh, phase diagram without a magnetic field. In that, all three uh, spin components, up, 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 down, plus, down, up, and down, down, occur equally in equal proportion. That's a miracle, in fact. And interestingly, in, although it's so complicated, the, the gap is isotropic as if it were a conventional superconductor. So it looks like this as an isotropic gap around the um, Fermi um, sphere. This is the projection. And because um, this isotropic gap protects the Fermi sphere, the specific heat vanishes exponentially as T goes to zero. This is why it's called the isotro or pseudo isotropic state. And interestingly enough, in BCS theory, in weak, weak coupling theory, um, only the B phase is stable below TC. There is no other phase. But then we know there is another phase, namely the, B, the, the A phase here, up here. And um, so in the A phase, the middle component is missing. We are only dealing with the spin state up, up, and down, down. These are called equal spin pairing states. And that gives rise to a strong gap as an isotropy and isotropy as first found by Anderson and Morel in 1961. Namely, the energy gap has point nodes. You see that here. The point node is at the north and the south pole, and the direction L is named precisely the orbital angular momentum of a Cooper pair. So in this projection you see um, here, it vanishes the gap. It's called the axial state because the existence of this axis. And this was something completely new at that time. Um, because now, because of this um, node, the specific heat vanishes much um, less fa fast, uh, much slower, namely with an algebraic law. And this was incredibly helpful to understand the pairing in the heavy fermion superconductors, which were discovered in the end of the 70s, and then the high TC cuprates in, in 86. And the A phase is stabilized by strong coupling effects. What does that mean? Well, as Anderson and Brinkman explained, the pair interaction depends on the pair correlation itself. So there's a feedback mechanism that stabilizes this A phase at high pressures where fluctuations are particularly strong. Let's um, look a little more into the spectrum near the point nodes of helium 3A because that's quite interesting. So we zoom in here, the blue is the Fermi C, which we can call, uh, call the vacuum. This is the energy gap, and these are the excitations. The Bogoljubov of quasi-particle energy is given by the usual expression. This um, should be seen three-dimensionally. This is actually a conical point. And then, in fact, we realize that because of the linear dispersion, this is 
the so-called Weil point as, as uh, introduced by Weil. And it's topologically protected, protected only by the topology of that phase, which I'm going to explain later. In fact, we can fiddle around and introduce a fictitious um, charge plus one, which we call chirality app for K parallel to L up here, and minus one chirality down if K is minus to L, for example, also here or here. And we see this is then a chiral superfluid. And then we can introduce a fictitious uh, vector potential and a fictitious electromagnetic momentum. And with that, to our great surprise, one can write the Bourdieu of quasi-particle energy in a completely covariant form with an anisotropic um, metric tensor. This was introduced by Volovic. So interestingly, um, and sort of counterintuitively, at low energies, um, helium-3, superfluid helium-3 shows a larger symmetry group, namely full uh, Lorentz invariance. It's, it's a chiral relativistic uh, Fermi system. Indeed, I mean, this is quite analogous to, to a neutrino, for example, right? And at this point, which is also sometimes called Fermi point, um, there is the possibility of spectral flow of fermionic of fermions, fermionic charge through this Fermi point. And that implies a non-conservation of the fermionic current. That is well known in particle physics, and that is there goes under the name of chiral anomaly or Adler anomaly. And that, because of that analogy, has actually been observed in superfluid helium-3, namely momentum exchange between superfluid and normal component was experimentally measured by quasi-particle scattering. And um, Wolovic has written a beautiful book about these um, things, namely um, the, let's see this, it covers something up, uh, the universe, in a helium droplet, and I just seen he wrote an update just which appeared about two weeks ago or so, um, Helium 3 Universe 2020. You can find that on the archive. The third phase, the A1 phase, that is this sliver only is stable in a external magnetic field, which lifts the spin degeneracy and then only the up-up component um, is there. And so a one phase is a liquid, but it's a magnetic liquid. It's a long range ordered magnetic liquid. Let's try to bring some order into this mess and talk about long range order and broken symmetries. This we learned from particle physics and it is very helpful here. You see, the transition from the normal liquid to into the A phase or into the B phase are both second order, so continuous phase transitions. Of course, the transition from A to B is first order. And we know that below TC, we have a higher order, but simultaneously a lower symmetry of the ground state. Now that we know particularly where from a ferromagnet here, here there are spins or magnetic moments above TC that is ordered average magnetization is zero. So they, there is an invariance, a symmetry group of three-dimensional rotations SO3. Below TC, they are aligned more or less. The average magnetization is finite. That is the order parameter, a vector order parameter. And now the only symmetry that remains is the um, rotation along the arrow. That is an SO2 or U1 symmetry, which is a subgroup. So we see that below TC, the SO3 rotation symmetry in spin space is spontaneously broken. In a liquid crystal, the same thing happens, but in orbital space. This is my view of a, a liquid crystal. Don't take it too seriously. Above TC, it's disordered. Symmetry group is SO3. <clears throat> below, there's ordering into a certain direction. And the only symmetry that remains is the rotation around this axis, which is U1 again. So below TC, the SO3 rotation symmetry in real space is spontaneously broken in a liquid crystal. Finally, a conventional superconductor. Above TC, we have 
electrons, quasi-particles. Below what you see, Cooper pairs form. So the pair amplitude is clearly zero above Tc, but it's finite, actually complex, because it has an amplitude and a phase below Tc. If we perform a gauge transformation, which means we multiply the creation operator by a phase, then clearly this doesn't change anything above Tc because the pair amplitude is zero anyway, but here, an additional factor e to the two i phi enters, so it's not gauge invariant. Since such a phase um, corresponds to a rotation perpendicular to a plane, this is, is the symmetry group SO2 or U1, which is spontaneously broken below Tc. So below Tc in a conventional superconductor, a U1 gauge symmetry is spontaneously broken. And that is what one refer refers to as conventional pairing. <clears throat> now in helium, superfluid helium three, we know that um, Cooper pairs have L equal to one, S equal to one in all three phases. And as I said, in every Cooper pair, there's a characteristic direction in orbital space and spin space. And due to the co quantum coherence, they're all in the same state, helium three, Superfluid helium-3 is at the same time a superfluid, a liquid crystal, and a magnet. That makes it so truly exceptional. And this is characterized by 18 real numbers, namely two, because the superfluid has two components, amplitude and phase, two L plus one, for L equal to one is three, times two S plus one, for S equal to one is three, so two times three times three, 18 real numbers, which can be assembled, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> into a complex three by three matrix with two indices, one in um, real space and one in spin space. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> in the superfluid, this big symmetry group, SO3 in spin, SO3 in space, um, in real space and U1 in concerning the gate is spontaneously broken as first pointed out by Tony Leggett. In fact, we, we should uh, multiply to it the parity operator and the time reverse. But clearly this is reminiscent of the big symmetries we know from particle physics. Now, <clears throat> An invest investigation where all phases obtained by systematically breaking the symmetry can be performed. And I just want to describe it in the case of helium 3A because it will help us to um, resolve the mystery. In helium 3A, the SO3 in spin space is broken down to U1 and the gauge, the gauge symmetry U1 is not broken by itself, but is broken jointly at, in a diagonal sense together with the SO3 in orbital space to a remaining U1. That means rotations now in orbital space are coupled to the gauge. This is called unconventional pairing and it was helium-3, superfluid helium-3 was the first case where this was observed. Translated into a simple picture, it means that in superfluid helium 3A, all Cooper pairs have an absolute orientation of the magnetic and the um, orbital direction in each Cooper pair. And this now solves the NMR mystery because I repeat, in helium 3A, all Cooper pairs, the, the, the green and the, the red arrows, orbital space and spin space are fixed but the relative orientation is not fixed. Now, what fixes the relative orientation? Well, this is in orbital space, this is in space space, so it must be a spin orbit coupling. And the pairing interaction is insensitive to spin orbit coupling. Spin orbit coupling is much too small. So we have to search for some kind of a spin orbit interaction. And there is almost none in that isotropic liquid except we have to go to the level of nuclear spins. 
Indeed, the interaction between spins, like in classical electrodynamic, depends on, um, it's, it's a spin orbit coupling because the energy is different um, if the spins are parallel or if they are head to head. But we said correctly, this interaction between um, the nuclear spins is so tiny, 10 to the minus seven, so it should not be important, it should wash out. But this argument is wrong because DNL are already long range ordered through the pairing interaction. Now, any interaction, as tiny as it may be, for example, the um, dipolar interaction between nuclear spins can come along and lift the degeneracy and actually fix the value of that angle. And because of the quantum coherence, this is the same in all Cooper pairs. And thus, the coupling of the orbital degrees of freedom to the spin give an additional rigidity to the spin. And that is precisely that term which was observed to be just depending on temperature. Namely, it's really just the dipole-dipole um, coupling times the square of the um, um, gap, average gap. And Tony Leggett, um, a brilliant paper, a series of brilliant papers uh, analyzed that. So in helium-3, because of the quantum coherence, the nu tiny nuclear dipole interaction is macroscopically enhanced and is actually measurable. And because of that and many other contributions of Tony Leggett, he received the Nobel Prize in 2003, together with um, Aprikosov and Ginsburg for pioneering contributions to the theory of superconductors and superfluids. Now, in, in view of the rich order parameter, and there, in fact, helium-3 is the mother of all topological systems. And I'm going to discuss that now um, with defects in mind. You see, um, these macroscopic directions in a Cooper pair can be oriented. Take helium 3A. A wall will orient the preferred direction, the orbital angular momentum of a Cooper pair, because the Cooper pair doesn't want to bump into the wall. So it wants to move in a, in a plane parallel to the wall, meaning that L is perpendicular. That is a boundary condition. So it means, for example, when there is a corner in a container, the, the, uh, and, and L always has to be perpendicular to the wall, it must look like this or like this, it's, it's chiral. And in fact, there is a difference between this and that, which, which was measured in 2012 with the torsional oscillator, uh, confirming this chirality. And also interesting, uh, if, if um, helium-3 is confined to a, to a slab or so, um, then the L vectors are all aligned, giving rise to a macroscopic total angular momentum. And these, these circles is my, my, my picture of a Cooper pair. And so like in the integer quantum Hall effect, actually this generates a spontaneous superfluid mass current along the edge, quite interesting. So that, that's the orientation of the orbital part of the order parameter. The magnetic field can orient the spin part. And altogether, this leads to what is called textures in the orbital, in the directions of the order parameter in complete analogy to liquid crystals. In fact, this term terminology was introduced by Pierre Dugene in the beginning of the 80s, 70s. And there are also now many possible defects, again, only in helium 3A. For example, there are two dimensional defects, a domain wall, or rather a soliton because they even have a dynamics. A domain wall in D or L because there is a Z2 symmetry, namely the, 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 the orientation, the relative orientation of spin and orbital direction um, contribution to the energy density is given by this, the, the square of the scalar product. And then we see, um, it doesn't depend on whether D is parallel or anti-parallel to L. So we can have a wall around the left. Let's say D is, always, is pointing to the right. Then L can be to the left and to the right here. And in between is a wall where it moves over. And that cannot be removed by any local operation. It's a topological defect. And there can also be a domain wall lattice and it can move. There are one dimensional. <clears throat> 
um, defects, vortices, they can be generated by rotating. You see, in a no neutral superfluid like helium-3, rotation is the same as applying a magnetic field in a charged superfluid in a superconductor. And there's a host of uh, vortices, for example, uh, non-singular, non singular, and there's a whole zoo of them. And finally, the um, Dirac's dream came true. They even monopoles consider such a sphere. And because of the boundary conditions, the L has to be perpendicular. So in the middle, there has to be a singularity, which due to energy reasons is pulled to the wall. And well, David Marmon named that a bujum. Hmm. Taking, <clears throat> this is a nonsensical poem for, by Lewis Carroll, The Hunting of the Snark. And the bujum is a particularly dangerous snark. I forget the details. Um, and, and the bujum is softly and suddenly vanishing away in a current. And in any case, David Merman had a big fight with the editor of PRL to use the word bujum in the title of his PRL, where he introduced it and he succeeded. You may wonder what happens if this you know, container gets smaller and smaller and reaches the, the um, coherence length, so nanoscale confinement. That's a very active field of research, which I'm not going to talk about. It stabilizes phases and destabilizes others. It leads to new surface states, energy zero, Majorana modes. And there, I just want to mention there's a review by Mizushima, a um, very long review in the uh, Japanese uh, physical journal. Uh, mm. oh, uh, uh, what is it? Um, journal of the Physical Society of Japan. And in fact, in this seminar, in the quantum fluids in isolation on November 5th, I've seen Dr. Yapa gave a very nice talk, Superfluid Helium-3 within the confines, where he discussed the role of confinement. And if you want to see that, go back to YouTube. So defects can be formed by geometric constraints and rotation. And there is a third quite independent mechanism, namely, it, they can be generated by rapidly crossing through symmetry breaking phase transition. And that is very interesting and that I'm going to explain now. Because I want to present you with the uh, big bang simulation in the low temperature lab. So we, we can use universality. U universality of physical systems allows for conclusions about seemingly very different systems. And so, in, um, in general, for high temperatures, there's a high symmetry, short range order, there's a phase transition, and below that, we have broken symmetry and long range order as discussed. Take spins, in the high temperature phase, it's paramagnetic, um, below TC, it is ferromagnetic, and there can be defects, let's say domain walls. In helium, helium-3 or helium-4, it doesn't matter, at high, large temperatures, it's norm, normal, normal liquid, below it's superfluid and there are defects, for example, vortices. Now, the interesting thing is the universe at its symmetry broken ground state, the physical vacuum can be viewed as a complicated condensed matter system. Namely, at very high temperature, shortly after the big bang, all forces and fields were unified. Then came a series of phase transitions leading to the elementary particles and fundamental interactions as we see them today. And there can also be defects. For example, cosmic strings introduced by Kibble as defects in relativistic quantum field theories. And at that time, he thought that they might be helpful to explain the granularity distribution of the galaxies. They could, he thought perhaps these would be nucleation points of galaxies. Now, today we know this is wrong because the, the Hubble Space Telescope tells us otherwise, but the idea is brilliant. And I want to explain that to you because it's also pertinent for helium-3. What happens at a rapid thermal quench through second order phase transition? Well, let's consider a system at t equal to below in, in the sort of in the symmetry broken state. Let's say we deposit some energy or heat up locally the system by depositing a particle or some reaction. Then the system heats up locally, a hot bubble, develops, expands, 
through entropic, entropic principle then cools down again. And the bubble is large, it cools, and so independently ordered regions will nucleate. They, these different regions, they are causally not connected. So they, 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 uh, they, they order in the direction they, they prefer. And as this um, comes together, we have a clustering and defect form, as you see, for example, here, it's, it's sort of a vortex looking from above. The defects overlap, <clears throat> and eventually you get what is called a vortex tangle. This is the uh, this is uh, what um, Kibble found. But what is the density of such defects? And this was clarified by Zurek in '85. And today, the Kibble-Zurek mechanism of defect formation through by rapidly going through a phase transition is a very big thing. But 30 years ago, the question is how to test that. And here, superfluid helium-3 was the decisive system. And amazingly, the same, same experiment essentially was done at two different places by two different groups. And here, here's what was done. The, these people took helium-3b, doesn't matter, in a rotating container, subjected to a neutron source, a neutron will uh, combine with helium-3, giving tritium in a proton, which because of momentum conservation go into opposite directions. The kinetic energy leads to a heating of the system as a heated bubble. This, as we saw, by when cooling leads to a vortex network. The vortex rings which <laughs> reach the outer surface here vanish, but the others assemble here in the middle which is rotating and where they can be detected by NMR. And it was, it was a great surprise. It was wonderful to see that the density predicted by the Kibble-Zurek mechanism was actually um, confirmed in this experiment. This was the first time this Kibble-Zurek mechanism, which today nobody speaks about Kibble-Zurek mechanism for cosmology anymore. It's, it's something for condensed matter physics these days, but it started all in superfluid helium-3. And I do not know, but I wonder whether that success not was the final trigger for the Nobel Prize, which was awarded in 1996. Okay, I was supposed to talk, uh, I was given 55 minutes. Uh, we started a little late, so I'm about at the end. I talk mainly about work in the past, and you may ask, um, is helium-3, is that, um, is anyone still interested in that? I can assure you that is the case. As I said, helium-3 is the mother of all topological systems. So there's a lot of work in that respect these days. But there's, there's a final issue, a single slide I want to show you that has to do with helium-3 in a disordered environment. Now, I said that helium is a particularly pure system perfectly pure. Now that can be boring at some time. So people say, ha, huh, let's see what happens if we introduce disorder. It's not easy to do, but um, one can do the following. One can introduce helium-3 into what is called aerogel. That is sort of a porous medium, highly porous. And here we see this um, silica is isotropic. You can fill it in and then um, the, the Cooper pairs sort of see um, this disorder. And already 25 years ago, it was found that the, due to the additional scattering has profound effects. The A phase is, is, is killed and the B phase is, is sort of pushed to lower temperatures. Now, more recently, An anisotropic, what is called nematic aerogel was used, made of these aluminum oxide strands, giving a preferred direction for scattering of the Cooper pairs. And this has a tremendously strong effect. And what was found that a new, the fourth phase was stabilized, the polar phase, which has a line node around the equator. So 
the phase diagram here is changed from the normal one goes into the polar phase and at lower temperatures, there is the polar distorted A phase and the polar distorted B phase. So a new phase, a fourth phase was discovered. And a few months later, this whole stuff, the um, anisotropic aerogel, where one finds the polar phase was put into a rotating cryostat. And Auti et al found what had been predicted 40 years earlier, namely so-called half quantum vortices. That's a vortex with half the quantum of vorticity. The other half is carried by a spin current. And so that was a triumph, but now it's also under great investigation because they are predicted to host unpaired Majorana modes because they, these are energy zero states in the middle of the vortex. And as you know, there's a great interest in Majorana um, particles. And that really brings me to the end. So my conclusion is this. If you think of superfluid helium-3, it would be good if you remembered that it's an anisotropic superfluid. It's P wave and the first triplet pair, um, pair condensate. The Cooper pairs have an internal structure, making it an unconventional um, superfluid. There are four bulk phases, three homogeneous, A, B, A1, and polar found in anisotropic disordered environment. And there's a multitude of collective modes through exciting the Cooper pair. All that can be explained and put in the frame of a large symmetry group, which is spontaneously broken. This allows one to make close um, connections with high and particle physics, and also to explain that um, zoo of topological defects, some of which I discussed. And that is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so if there are any questions, you can either unmute yourself and ask it or you can raise your virtual hand. So maybe I'll start off. So you mentioned that Nair was interested in generating these topological defects in these systems. So um, in general, so I know there's, let's say like a zoo of different materials when these topological defects might occur. So, I mean, it's Kataev chains, and there's Kataev honeycomb lattices and spin liquids and that might have these topologically non-trivial excitations. So what advantage would we have in looking at these topological defects in um, such systems as you talked about rather than and some, let's say, like spin liquid material or some surface code. Excuse me, what, what is the question? So, I mean, where, why, basically, in terms of like searching for these topological defects, so, right, you mentioned looking for these topological defects in, um, say, me, um, this quantum fluid. So, in terms of, say, like as a resource for some novel quantum technology, mm how what would it be advantage of find of looking for them and say the materials you talked about versus say like the, yes. the tour code okay I, I understand um well i don't think that at the moment because of this uh, the low temperatures this is of any technological importance on the other hand i should say i i was surprised myself when i talked with experimentalists recently they say to get down a cryostat down to two milliK is these days no problem. Just push a button. 20, 30 years ago, a, a, a graduate student had to work three years to get that done. Today, you push a button mm -hmm. and go down to two Kelvin. So, so um, this is not this is no rocket science anymore. Nonetheless, to 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 have a quantum computer, it may be difficult. So at the moment, this is uh, pure fundamental research. Mm -hmm. uh, but the good thing is, you see. This is particularly pure. There are no, there, there are no, um, you see, in, in a solid, you have long range interactions, you have electrons, you have ladders and whatever that can disturb what you actually want to see. That is not the case in helium three. It is a pure liquid and you can just zoom in to that, um, to that uh, Majorana mode or to that vortex and investigate it. But for, technological purpose, I don't think it will be interesting for a long time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, promote.
uh, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Joshua. Um, and thank you, Professor Volhard. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, great to hear kind of the hist historical thank aspects of it. Um, so my question, I think, relates to this last point you brought up and also going back to kind of the nodal point that you see in helium uh, 3A phase. Now, if you put in the aerogel, you do get this, this nodal line. And you mentioned something that they found it with regard to this kind of vial point in A. So now that there is this line node, is there something interesting that you would see in this A phase uh, resulted from a, a nodal line instead of a point? You mean what one now sees in the polar phase? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, the polar phase is a topological phase, and um, but experiments are more difficult to pursue because you see you have to now to work in an anisotropic aerogel, and I don't think that a torsional oscillator works nicely there. So um, I don't think that this disordered environment allows as many experiments as, as they are possible in helium 3A. But the next step concerning the polar phase and this anisotropic aerogel is to put in a strong magnetic field. And I believe that um, in so some time from now, they will find a fifth phase, namely the planar phase, um, which is yet another, uh, would be the fifth phase. I'm, I guess it should be around. And, um, but, well, clearly, you see, um, the polar phase with this line node is, is more uh, like, like D-wave superconductivity or so. Again, the specific heat would, I suppose, it's then T-square, um, even, even sort of um, less fast going to zero. But the planar phase, I, 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 I forget. So, not as many experiments have been performed, in particular because it's only known for about three years. Um, so more I cannot really say to answer that question. Actually, if I can have a yeah, quick follow-up, uh, I guess you, the planar phase is pretty similar to, like the planar phase occurs with the B phase, right? And it's, as far as I know, very similar to the A phase. Would you expect a difference? Because they both would have kind of a point, um, yeah, point note. Well, yes, but they're topologically different, so they better be different. I mean, so, right? we, we, are, we are good in finding differences between things, even if they're tiny, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, on any other questions? So maybe I'll wait five seconds in case anyone wants to unmute themselves. Okay, so let's thank Professor Volhart again. Okay, thank you for listening and thank you for asking your questions and all the best. Thank you.